Good evening. Welcome to a special edition of the International Grapevine. This is your host, Wallingford Lee. Tonight on the International Grapevine, we're going to be talking about colon cancer issues, how dangerous it is, and how many people it affects in the United States of America and also in the entire world. And, you know, colon cancer is a very dangerous thing that if you don't deal with it early and real fast, it could give you a lot of different complications. We're lucky tonight to have as a special guest in the program, a doctor that's been on our program before and give us a great deal of pleasure and of course satisfaction to have Dr. Luis Agosti on our show again. He's a professional surgical oncology clinical professor of surgery uh, working for Sokta School of Medicine at Ofstra. Again, doctor, welcome to our program. And again, it's such a pleasure to have you back on board again. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, we love to share the information with the public in general because uh, I think the, the more people are informed, the better they can make decisions regarding their health. I couldn't agree with you more, especially with such a dangerous thing like that. What exactly is colon cancer? Okay. Colon cancer, uh, a cancer uh, by itself is the, uh, a tumor, uh, a malignant tumor that grows uh, out of control and it can uh, cause damage to the organ where it's growing and also can spread to other parts of the body, affecting their function and causing destruction. And so you can have cancer anywhere in the body, but when it comes to cancer of the colon, the colon is, is also called the large bowel. It starts with the end of the small bowel, ends up with the rectum and the anus. It's about 150 uh, centimeters uh, long. And, and uh, that's where, you know, the uh, tumor can develop. And uh, the, the um, colon cancer is a pretty significant um, matter uh, of discussion because it's the second most common cancer in, the, in America. You know, uh, for women, it's second to breast cancer. And for men, it's second to prostate cancer. So, so per year, every year, we get about... 150,000 cases that are diagnosed uh, in America alone. How, how come it develops so fast in a human body? Because I know in my research, it tells me that if you don't deal with it right away, it can spread all, all over your body. How come it develops so fast in the body? Well, there are different types of cancer. Okay. And some develop slowly, some develop very fast. And uh, most commonly, uh, the... Uh, the uh, cancers start from a small polyp. A polyp is a growth, a growth in the lining of the uh, uh, colon that starts of being benign. It means non-malignant, non-cancerous, but it can grow. As it grows, it changes. And then uh, as it uh, develops, it can become cancerous. At that time, it starts invading the wall of the uh, colon. Also, it can get into the bloodstream in the lymphatic you know, stream and end up in other organs, particularly the liver, can go in the lungs, it can go in, in the uh, bones and, and causing a lot of damage. So uh, most of the times it's a pretty slow growing uh, tumor, but you do have cases what you call interval um, uh, cancers. Uh, for example, the, uh, we recommend that you do a colonoscopy every 10 years, if you have an average risk, I mean, you have no family history uh, and a no uh, genetic, no genetic mutation causing cancer, the average will be about every 10 years. However, we've had you know, people that have had uh, 
colonoscopies that were completely negative, and within a year, they would develop a cancer. Those are what they call interval uh, cancers. And those cancers are more aggressive, they grow more uh, uh, rapidly, and they, uh, they are more difficult to treat. Does it develop like when you do a colonoscopy and you go in and you find polyps? If the polyps are growing, is that a sign of cancer? Or you just burn off the polyps if they're large or small? How does that work? So if you, uh, there are different types of polyps. Anytime you do a colonoscopy, you find a polyp, you should remove it. You okay. should remove it because that, that polyp uh, has a potential of growing and of transforming itself into you know, a bad actor. Uh, so anytime uh, you see a polyp, you would take it out. When you take it out, you send it to the pathology lab and they can tell you which type of polyp it is. It can be hyperplastic, it can be adenomatous, it can be villus. Depending on the type, there is, uh, uh, the villus is the most aggressive one, the one that can turn more rapidly into uh, cancer, while the hyperplastic is less likely to become uh, cancerous. But you know, anyway, as they grow, they can change from one type to another. And, and, and uh, so that's why anytime you see a polyp, it should be removed. What are the symptoms of colon cancer? So there, there are two types of uh, colon, uh, two types of manifestation. Usually it depends on which side of the colon the uh, uh, tumor develops. And uh, for example, on the, uh, the colon uh, on the right side is larger, is larger, while it's narrower on the left side. So uh, given that the, uh, the colon is like a tube, the tube is, is like a pipe, it's larger. So therefore, it takes a lot longer for the uh, tumor to grow and to end up causing a blockage. However, the tumor can bleed. It can bleed. And then the, uh, it not, doesn't have to be like bright red blood like they're going to see. It can be what they call an, an occult bleeding, like it's bleeding slowly in the stool, and unless you test for it, you won't see it. And uh, so in that case, you know, the first symptoms you might find will be anemia. The person is anemic. Wow. They uh, have low blood uh, count. And the person might complain that they, they are tired, they don't have any energy, and, and you, you look at the, the uh, their eyes, they can be very pale, you know, the skin can be very pale. Those are a sign of anemia. On the other side of the colon, uh, on the uh, left side, the colon is narrower. So anytime the tumor starts growing, it can cause a blockage. So you're going to have more symptoms uh, like uh, uh, the person is going to be constipated, it's going to um, uh, see uh, a change in the bowel habits instead of moving about reg regularly every day, you can see, you know, for a few days, you might be uh, constipated. Then, uh, then you, be, you have diarrhea. With the diarrhea, you release, you know, the, the blockage, but uh, then oh, again, you become blocked again. So these changes of uh, alternating diarrhea and constipation or progressive constipation, those are all signs of, of cancers. Yeah, my so, research uh, tells me some of the things that you mentioned about diarrhea is one, some signs of blood in the stool, uh, constipation, and straining uh, in the bowel movement are certain symptoms and signs of, of colon cancer, and it's important to go to a doctor immediately, supposedly. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I've seen so many times people start having uh, uh, bleeding, they would notice some blood in the stool. And they would try to diagnose themselves. They say, oh, it's because I ate this or because I ate that or because I ate something that was red. And, it, uh, and ignoring it can go, go on for months before they finally see a doctor. Meanwhile, the cancer is growing in them. So anytime you see blood, is that always due to cancer? Because you can have other problems. You can have uh, hemorrhoids, you know, can cause bleeding as well. But, you know, don't diagnose yourself. Go to the doctor, have them check you out, see, make sure that you don't have a tumor growing inside of you. 
Well, it's ironic that you mentioned that, you know, because one of the stigma that I had heard before I started doing research, that most of the time men tend to get colon cancer. But I also find out that it's possible that women can get colon cancer. Am I correct about that? Absolutely. So if you look at you know, the whole um, uh, colon, and you, have, you can divide the uh, colon in uh, colon and rectal. Colon cancers, the, uh, the upper part of the colon, and the rectal cancer is lower 15 centimeters of the, uh, of the uh, large bowel. So uh, as far as the colon is concerned, it's about even between men and women. However, when it comes to rectal cancer, it's more common in men than in women. So overall, if you put them together, you will see more colon colorectal cancers in men than women. But as far as the colon is concerned, so the risk is about even. Uh, and uh, you should, uh, both uh, the recommendation for colonoscopy, they are valid for both men and women. How important it is to clean your colon or clean your, your intestines? And what is the process and something like that? Well, so this is a bit of a controversial issue because uh, you see a lot of uh, uh, people, um, that I say paraprofessional, they would say, well, you have to take colon cleanser and then uh, they give you enemas and that can be dangerous. I've seen people you know, that would go to this process of cleansing, quote unquote. And uh, when you take an enema, not only you take out the stool, but you can take out very important electrolytes like magnesium, you know, it, it, that could be removed. I've seen people come to the hospital seizing because they have a low level of magnesium because they have taken so many uh, enemas. So you have to be very careful about that. So and, don't overdo uh, it. I'm sorry? Don't overdo it then with the enema. Don't overdo it. And then, so the, uh, it's very important you know, to uh, move your bowels regularly. Um, and uh, one of the theories about colon cancer is that we would, would have carcinogens in our diet. And then the, as we eat and then we ingest these carcinogens, these elements that cause cancer, they would uh, get digested and go into our colon since the passage of the stool is slower in the large bowel than the small bowel, so there will be more contact between the uh, uh, carcinogen uh, elements and the wall of the, of the colon. And um, so that's one of the theories for colon cancer. And uh, so uh, because of that, there are all kind of uh, recommendations as far as uh, eating uh, bran, a lot of fibers, trying to uh, activate the uh, flow of the stool in the colon so it is, you don't keep them in contact with the wall of the colon for a long period of time. So that's one of the real you know, uh, good medical advice, you know, trying to avoid constipation. Uh, but as far as having uh, those enemas, people have go to these clinics where they would get enemas for a whole weekend, you know, that's absolutely not recommended and you shouldn't do that. I would, I would begin talking about uh, colon cancer and the dangers of it and, uh, and complications. How widespread is it in America, the colon cancer? Uh, my understanding that uh, of all the cancers, it is either number two or number three killer if you don't address it early. I want to talk about how widespread it is here in America and more importantly, at what age a man or a woman should begin taking those type of tests out of concern. Great. So it, it all depends on the uh, personal history. So that's why you cannot, you know, use the same criteria for everybody. When you are taking a, a history, you have to address the family history. That's a very important issue. The, the, usually you should have a three-level family history. You should have your, your, yourself, you know, your uh, siblings, your parents, your grandparents, if possible, even great grandparents. So, with all this information, you can, you know, construct a, a family tree and then see what's the medical history in the family. So, somebody who's had uh, uh, cancer uh, it, among the uh, parents, uh, father, mother, brother, sister, that person is considered to be at risk. Therefore, they should start 
doing colonoscopies at an earlier age. And, uh, but for the average population with no family history whatsoever, the, the recommendation is to start doing at age 50. At age 50, you do your first colonoscopy and then the rest depends on what is found. If the colonoscopy is completely normal, completely normal, you can you know, wait 10 years before you do the next one. If you have polyps, again, depending on the type of polyps, you might have to do it earlier than uh, 10 years. Sometimes it can be within two years, maybe three years or five years, but it definitely would have to be less than, than 10 years. So uh, that's you know, for the person with no uh, risk factors. But if there are some um, syndromes you know, where the person has the uh, genetic uh, alteration and that causing what they call the polyposis syndrome. So the people that tend to form a lot of polyps. And this can start as early as the uh, teenage, you know, people that start having uh, wow. polyps, you know, in the, uh, you, you 15 years old, you're having polyps. Would that and, be because of genetic? Genetic, genetics. Okay. Yeah. And um, so obviously these people have to get you know, colonoscopies more frequently. And sometimes they might have to do it every year because uh, if you see those polyps as they're forming, you remove them as they're forming, you can prevent them from turning into cancer. So th that's the, uh, sometimes, sometimes it might be, uh, there might be so many polyps in the colon that the best answer is to take out the colon completely, completely take out the colon. And then in that case, you can either do uh, preserve, preserve the rectum, you connect, connect the small bowel to the rectum, or you can give a colostomy, an ileo, I'm sorry, an ileostomy. I mean, you bring the stool directly to the skin level so that you can uh, avoid the risk of having uh, cancer. And what about other, what you just said about taking the colon out? That requires, that, that would take a surgery, wouldn't you say, to do Surgery, that? correct. Okay, okay. Surgery. And then when you take it out, what is the purpose? To clean it? put it back in, or you're going to cut part of the colon out and join back in? No, if you take it out, that's it. You take it out completely. Okay. The person lives without a colon. Wow. And that, that's, that's possible. And uh, there are a lot of people that are well known uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. that have lived. I mean, there is even, even a professional you know, football player who, who was living without a colon. It was, you know, you know, performing at the level of the NFL professionally. And there are some, uh, I, I think, I'm not sure, but I think Benny Goodman, the famous uh, saxophonist, mm -hmm. I think he may have had a coronary re removal. Uh, if not, I think, I think so. You know, but uh, I wouldn't, um, uh, but, but, you know, there are really quite a lot of, uh, there are nurses working in the hospital, there are doctors working in the hospital that have had their colon removed. And you can uh, live a normal life without a colon. So, but what is the process that you go through after you remove the colon? Let's say for the first three months, is there a certain amount of medication? Do you have to wear a colostomy bag or anything like that at the beginning? Oh, definitely. Because, you know, then the, um, you don't have a rectum anymore. You never rectum anymore, so the stool has to come out in a bag. A and uh, initially, the uh, you lose a lot of water because the uh, the uh, f the uh, uh, fluid in the uh, the stool in the small bowel is very liquidy, so you can lose like two three liters of water every day. So that has to be replaced, and then you have to take medication to slow it down because if you don't. You can get dehydrated and your kidneys could shut down and you wow. can have a lot of problems. You can die from that. So, so uh, it's eventually the body adjusts to that. And then you could see a slowdown, a progressive slowdown of the uh, fluid and the, the, as the uh, body educates itself and the small bowel learns to absorb more of the water. So uh, even uh, at the end, the stool becomes you know, firmer and it, uh, the person doesn't have to lose so much uh, water every day. Is it permanent to keep the colostomy bag or is it just for a period of time? 
Well, it depends on the reason why you had it. Sometimes it can be a per permanent colostomy, sometimes a temporary colostomy. For example, if you have a, uh, a cancer in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the rectum, let's say that causes a blockage, and then it becomes an emergency that you, you have to rush to the operating room to just uh, relieve uh, the, uh, the blockage. And you can do a temporary uh, colostomy and ileostomy. And after you have, the person has had the tumor removed, they've had the chemotherapy or radiation, whatever is needed, then you can put it back together. But you know, sometimes if you have a cancer that's low, very low in the uh, rectum, then you might not be able to save the uh, rectum. And in that case, the person has a permanent uh, either colostomy or ileostomy, and then you have to live with it, you know, uh, forever. Um, that's, that's, that's an amazing thing, obviously, and a very serious thing. As we get back here in the International Grapevine talking about the dangers of colon cancer with, with Dr. Lewis here, we want to continue going a little bit deeper in the process of it, the pros and the cons of the danger. Of it. We'll be right back on International Grapevine as we continue moving forward talking about colon cancer. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to the entire audience of the International Grapevine. This is your host, Wallenford Lee. In behalf of the family of the International Grapevine, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a happy and prosperous New Year. In behalf of the family of the International Grapevine. And we're back here in International Grapevine talking about the issues of colon cancer. What a dangerous thing that can be if it's not discovered early. And if you don't take care of yourself, and that's why when in doubt, recur to a doctor. There's nothing wrong with the examination. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, colonoscopy is not a painful thing. In most cases, they do sleep you. And, but I'm not a doctor. The person who talked to about a doctor, uh, about these type of things is a doctor. But what I'm saying to you is, they are uh, medicine that advanced so much. There are so many good things out there and you can save yourself. The most important thing is to recognize some of the symptoms, which we talked about in the first 10, 14 minutes of this program and to recognize also genetic, whether your parents have had it and stuff like that, or recognize the change in your body, your stool, whether it have blood, uh, the, the diarrhea. There are many, there are many signs that are there. And there's nothing wrong with going to a doctor to find out to make sure that you're all right. Doctor, how important is early detention, detention and all these things? It's very, very important. That's the most important thing. And, and uh, for example, you could uh, pick up a, uh, a polyp. Yeah, I see polyp can transform into cancer. But then if you pick it up very early, you can see changes that are very superficial. They haven't invaded, you know, the colon. You can just take them out with the col colonoscope without having to cut the patient open. But uh, if you don't do that, uh, then uh, the uh, tumor can spread into the uh, wall of the colon. At the time, you have to have surgery to cut part of the colon out. And, um, and not only that, you would have to remove the lymph glands uh, that drain the uh, lymphatics from the, the colon and, and uh, at that time, you send all this to the pathologist. They have to tell you how deep the tumor has penetrated the wall of the colon. And also, if the, it has spread to the lymph glands uh, around the colon. If it has so spread to those glands, it's dangerous. Absolutely. So that it makes it stage three. So, so you have four stages of colon cancer. And then uh, stage one will be a tumor that's within the wall of the uh, colon. It, it usually is very superficial. Stage two is the uh, cancer that has spread, you know, through the inner lining. It can reach into the muscular layer and uh, of the, uh, of the uh, colon and even up to the uh, surface of the colon. But it hasn't spread to the lymph glands yet. 
once it has reached the lymph glands, it's stage three. Then uh, from there, it can go to the liver, it can go uh, to uh, the, the, the lungs, the, uh, the bones, and Does once it it's spread to this organ, that's stage four. And then usually that's more difficult to treat. So as you can see by this staging system, the uh, lower the staging, the better the prognosis. The higher the staging, the worse the person is going to do. And the more intensive, the more difficult treatment the person has to, will have to go through. As we talk about screening, one of the things that I read, uh, and I'm not sure it's accurate, that when you get about between 45 and 50, you should start beginning to have some type of screening uh, for colon cancer. Is that accurate, more or less? 45, uh, so as I said uh, before, uh, the uh, recommendation is to start doing colonoscopies at age 50. For somebody with no sign or symptoms, somebody with no family history uh, at all, then you'll be at, at age 50. But if you have family members that have had cancer at a younger age, then you have to start doing your colonoscopies earlier than that. Uh, plus, there are some syndromes, for example, the, something called the Lynch syndrome, where you have a type of specific genetic alteration, where the person not only has colon cancer, but the person can have uterine cancer, they can have breast cancer, they can have gastric cancer, they have different cancers that come together in that Lynch syndrome. So if that are the case, then there's a blood test you can do to see if you do have it or not. If you do have it, then you're going to have to start, as soon as you're diagnosed with that uh, condition, you're going to start having colonoscopies and preferably uh, more often than, uh, than 10 years. You could be every year or every two years, but you have to be more often than every, every 10 years. Uh, so uh, there is also another condition that predisposes people to colon cancer. It's called ulcerative colitis. It's a disease where you have the destruction of the lining of the uh, colon. Oh. And it, uh, the, uh, the um, I mean, it's a very uh, um, frustrating disease because we don't have, you know, a... Uh, a real treatment you know, for it because what we do usually, we tend to block the immune response because it's like the body is destroying its own colon. And we uh, give either corticosteroids or we use you know, some uh, immune blocking agents uh, to stop the destruction. Uh, but you know, it's been shown that this disease, as it goes along, the uh, changes that develop in the colon that can lead to cancer. Wow, wow. How prevalent is cancer, uh, colon cancer in the African American population? Uh, my research tells me that a great deal uh, Afro American, as myself, tend to come up with that type of thing. Is that a genetic thing? So I would say that it's uh, mostly probably uh, dietary. dietary. Okay. And there was a very famous uh, study done back in the uh, 70s. Mm -hmm. And they looked at Japanese uh, population. They followed the migration from Japan to Hawaii and to California. They take three groups of uh, Japanese people. In Japan, you eating the regular uh, Chinese, uh, I mean, Japanese diet, the uh, rate of colon cancer was very low. And uh, as they moved to Hawaii, the group that lived in Hawaii, there was somewhat uh, in between in the tradition. They still you know, kept you know, uh, the traditional Japanese uh, diet, but also they started incorporating some more American you know, like steak and, and uh, hamburgers and all, all this stuff. And when they arrived to uh, uh, California, the second generation, basically uh, the uh, rate of cancer in that group was the same as that of the average American. So, you know, as the diet changed, the, the uh, risk of cancer increased. So it's a very interesting you know, problem also because when you look at the, the uh, African countries, African countries, you know, the uh, rate of colon cancer is pretty low 
compared to the Western countries. Wow. Pretty low. And they also that has to do with the diet because the uh, recognize that, you know, the, uh, there's more uh, green, very leafy uh, uh, diet, you know, that you know, the African consume, you know, compared to the uh, European uh, that have a more processed uh, uh, food and then they uh, have uh, a greater risk of colon cancer. And, and um, so it, it, it was a uh, very uh, interesting study um, uh, done uh, by uh, a physician that you know, work in Africa and looking at the stools of the African. Usually the stool of the African was, was big, firm, hard, while the this, school this stool for the Europeans tend to be softer and, and, uh, and uh, mushier. That could and, be a dietary thing. Dietary, definitely the factor. Yeah. So that's why there are recommendations to uh, eat uh, eat more fiber. But at the same time, you know, the uh, thing there might be some uh, uh, cancer causing agents in the uh, the meat and in the fat that we consume. So, so that's why it, not only you have to increase your uh, your fiber, but also limit the amount of red meat that you eat and also um, reduce the amount of fat that you consume. Interesting. How uncomfortable is the colonoscopy? Is it very uncomfortable? The colonoscopy is most of the times you're not going to feel anything. Okay. Because you know, it's done you know, with the, uh, most of the time with an anesthesiologist. You're given medication, the propofol, and you sleep throughout the whole thing. And then uh, sometimes during the procedure, and uh, because some people have colons that are very tortuous, so you might have some discomfort. You might see the person wince, you know, uh, during the procedure, but, but they don't even remember that because they are sedated during the procedure. They don't feel anything. So uh, it's uh, really, it shouldn't be a concern at all. As far as the risk of complication, is very, very, very low. You're talking about maybe a one in 5,000, one in 10,000 cases, where you're going to have a perforation or hemorrhage that will require surgery, but it's a very, very rare you know, uh, problem. The um, people sometimes are concerned about the need uh, for a bowel prep. So certainly, it, you do have to have a bowel prep. That means you have to clean the stool out of the colon. Otherwise, the uh, uh, gastroenterologist or the person doing the colonoscopy won't be able to see clearly the wall of the, uh, of the colon. So, it's so before important. the colonoscopy, there's got to be a preparation then. There's Absolutely. That you have to drink the night before, I think, or some stuff like that. Absolutely. So clean, clean out your, your bowel, clean out your, 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 colon, your, your colon for that matter, right? Yeah. So uh, usually we recommend that within 24 hours before the surgery, for the average person, you only take liquids, only drink juice. You can eat, eat some jellos, but no solid food, definitely no vegetables, no green uh, leaf uh, um, food, no salad, nothing, just liquids the day before. I think you can have a little soup, if my memory serves me right, that there's a a little, something in liquid though, that, you know, you liquid, can't have but some anything. clear, clear soup, clear soup. Uh, um, and, um, and, and then the, the, uh, in the evening before there are different types of prep, you know, the, uh, the, uh, standard one will be the, the uh, go lightly will be, which is the gallon, a gallon of water that you have to drink. That's, that's the, uh, the cheapest. That's the one that the, uh, the insurance companies would pay for, you know, most often you won't have to pay anything for it. Uh, but it's, it takes some time because you have to drink the whole gallon. There are other you know, uh, preps, you know, called soup prep, for example, where you don't have to drink a gallon. And uh, you really have two jars, two jars of eight ounces each. Mm -hmm. And you drink it like four hours apart. After you drink the first one, you, you chase it with uh, four glasses of water. And then the uh, four hours later, you take a second one, which is with eight glasses of water, and that's it. 
and with that's the uh, easiest one. But you know the uh, insurance companies don't pay for it. Usually, it would cost you about hundred dollars uh, to buy that uh, super. Most insurance doesn't cover that, or you have to pay cash itself. Depend your type of insurance, but you know people with the the low level insurance they, usually they won't cover it, and they uh, would have to go to the gallon, the go likely uh, for a, a, a gallon of uh, water to drink, you know, over a period of uh, two 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 and a half hours. In certain colonoscopies, I imagine you can pick up. Um, the problems right there, because I think the goal of the colonoscopy is to get in to see to make sure what's going on in there, if there's problems or no problems. So I, I, I guess after that, depends on what you see or what, what, what you take out in the polyps, then you decide what you're going to do. If they're clean, they're home free. But if there's complications, that's where you have to sit down and tell them what the complication is and where you go from there, I imagine. C certainly. So uh, if you have a clean, uh, what they call a negative colonoscopy, mm -hmm. and uh, basically the person is, uh, is, um, is good, you know, for five, 10 years, depending on the situation. And then if there are polyps, as I mentioned before, there are different types of polyps. The polyps can be benign, they have been non-cancerous, all the way to cancerous. And then uh, if the polyp is cancerous, Sometimes you can just take it out with a snare. You can just take it out. You can bite it off the wall. And then now there have been a lot of progress made, a lot of technology advancement in the colonoscopy so that a person who has a small cancer, sometimes they can have it removed endoscopically without having to do surgery. So, so they have different techniques that have been developed for that. If they can show that the cancer is still superficial as in spread through the wall of the colon. Sometimes you can take it out without having to uh, do surgery per se, opening the, be the uh, belly or do laparoscopy to uh, take the colon out. What is the responsibility of, um, of a cancer patient to manage colon cancer? Obviously it's gonna be directed by the doctor. Does he have to change his diet in some case? What is, how can he manage um, the colon cancer, or it depends on how deep the cancer is. Right. So, you know, we mentioned the staging before. Right. And then uh, it's not until, uh, if you have a colon cancer, it's not until after the surgery is done. They have removed the part of the colon, the lymph nodes. They have done the scans, uh, CAT scans, or PET scan to look at the whole body. Can you uh, know exactly what stage the tumor is in? And depending on the stage, if the person has stage zero or stage one, uh, usually you don't need to do any more treatment other than having follow-up. Usually a year later, you would do a, a colonoscopy. And then uh, probably uh, for the first five years, you will have it more often. Then if there is no recurrence, then you can start to space it out. Um, but if, uh, let's say, you find the uh, tumor is more than stage one, is more advanced, then uh, there, or if to find that the tumor has spread to the lymph glands or the tumor has spread to uh, the liver, for example, then you're going to need other treatment, what they call adjuvant treatment. And that's going to be chemotherapy uh, most of the times. If it's in the rectum, uh, in the, the end, it could be chemotherapy and radiation therapy uh, to eliminate possible residual cancer that might be still in the body. Um, so if the uh, tumor has spread to the liver, and then uh, usually they would start with some chemotherapy so that you, you can see how, uh, the, if, how aggressive that tumor is. If the, uh, the after, let's say, three to six months, you, you see that the tumor hasn't grown anywhere else, sometimes you may might go in and remove part of the liver with the cancer. And then uh, that would uh, be a satisfactory uh, treatment. And that can be compatible with the long uh, survival. Um, other development have, you know, occurred over the past few years. Um, they have been able to, thanks to genomics, uh, they can study the genomic 
profile of the tumor and see which tumor is going to act aggressively, which one is more likely to uh, be uh, a slow uh, grower. So with this uh, test, you can uh, see uh, which person is likely to benefit from uh, chemotherapy, which one might not need the chemotherapy. Because if it's stage three, that means the lymph nodes are involved, you're definitely going to need chemotherapy. But if it's stage two, then uh, you may or may not need chemotherapy. That's when we'll do that special test of the genetic profile of the tumor and see whether the person would benefit from chemotherapy or not. I would say if it's stage three or if it gets to the liver, it's very, very dangerous at that stage. Very, very serious. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Doc, uh, we've run out a little bit out of time. I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the family of Grapevine to thank you so much for being our special guest and for educating our mind and bringing all these important things to us, what to look for, what the expectations are, and how to go about things. We don't have words to thank you again for being our guest, and we hope that you'll be kind enough to come back and work with us because we love working with you because you tell it like it is. So it's my pleasure to be here. And once again, I would like to remind the audience that don't diagnose yourself. If you don't feel well, go and see your doctor. If you see blood in your stool, don't try to guess what might be causing it. Go and see a doctor because those are this might be the only chance you have to get the cure of the cancer. So, and, and again, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to wish happy holidays to all your audience Absolutely. and to yourself. And you. uh, until the next time. Absolutely. And again, this is Wallingford Lee saying goodnight for the International Grapevine and saying to you, we hope that you have paid attention to the doctor here because we've brought out a lot of important information. We hope to see you next week at the same time at the same place. And again, this is Walden for at least saying good night for the International Grapevine. Good night. Good night. Bye.